Good morning. Thank you. I get the privilege of continuing with our series, The Lamb Wins. Except um, we're a little disordered because I was given my sermon topic before all of this. And um, so we're not in order, but rest assured, we will go back to the few of the seven churches that we missed after I do this one. So I'm getting the privilege to talk to you about the church of Philadelphia. And uh, Pastor Mel will go back and cover the other churches. But yeah. Um, one thing I didn't realize was that the church of Philadelphia carries a message of an impending trial. A trial that will be a global trial something that will affect the whole earth. And the first thing I thought when I read that was, we know nothing about that. Nothing at all, right? Just kidding. I think right now we know all too well what a global trial looks like. I'm not trying to say that the trial that is mentioned in Revelation here is this is that trial. No, there has been many global trials since this was written, and who knows, there will probably be more. But that impending trial hit home. Because none of us, at least I wasn't, prepared for this trial. And as I have sat in my home um, on quarantine since we just got back from Belize, I have officially finished my quarantine. It's day two of social isolation and not just quarantine. It's very exciting. Um, very exciting. I went to Target yesterday and got groceries. And I was like a kid in a candy store, man. Nobody was there. It was great. Um, but anyways, as I have sat in my home spending way too much time on social media with Nothing better to do in some ways, twiddling my thumb, doing my part for the cause. I have seen many statements talking about this global pandemic, this global trial, and equating it to the apocalypse. But not just equating it to the apocalypse, but saying that this wasn't the apocalypse that we were anticipating. Because for most of us, our view of the apocalypse has been seen through a lens of the Cold War and then Hollywood's latest zombie movies. So we all were expecting something more like that in terms of a global trial. Even preppers were unprepared. While preppers were building bunkers and stocking up on ammo. Nobody thought to stock up on toilet paper. I included. Nobody thought that toilet paper would be so needed in this time. All humor aside, we were not prepared. We weren't prepared for the toilet paper shortage, yes, but we were not prepared for the food shortage. We weren't prepared for the lack of hand sanitizer. We weren't prepared to move all non-essential careers and school online. That's been a huge learning curve this week for me, and I'm sure many of our students. But we weren't prepared for the effect that this would have on low-income families all around the world who were losing their jobs. We weren't prepared for the risk of those on the front lines. And we weren't prepared for death. We weren't prepared to watch the numbers grow. And we weren't prepared to have to sit here in isolation and doing nothing. We can talk all we want about the comparison to the flu, but let's leave that all aside. We can talk about who's being affected, but let's leave that all at the door, because right now, 
the thing that scares us the most is that death toll. We weren't ready, and no matter what the situation, death is a terrible thing. And as we sit here in isolation in our living rooms, we weren't ready, and we contemplate, we find ourselves in this place of going on and on, playing out the what-ifs we never, ever thought were possible. Things that we never imagined we would have to experience. And the very best thing for us to do feels like nothing. All the unknowns, the endless possibilities, crippling us with worry. What if? The story of the Church of Philadelphia, this letter to the Church of Philadelphia, might tell of a trial and tell of an unknown thing to come, but that is not where it leaves us. We can look there, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. An angel of the, uh, oh, sorry. And that to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia writes, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, and he who has the keys of David. He who opens, no one can shut, and shuts, no one can open. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I read the seven churches, I skim over those introductory parts that describe Jesus. But I want us to remember, as we are on this journey through Revelation, that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of end times. And these little snippets as introductions to who is speaking, which is Jesus in this case, are important parts that tell us stuff about Jesus. Tell us things about who he is. And the very first thing in verse 7 that it tells us about Jesus is he who is holy. He who is holy. Now, this is important to our historical audience, and I want to give you some background information. So, the original Hebrew language, way back when, they didn't use vowels, just consonants, which might sound really silly to us, but don't worry, they caught up and they added vowels in later. Um, So they didn't have uh, vowels, they only had consonants, and you would assume the vowels because you would use that word so you knew which vowel went there, basically. And so at the same time, it became inappropriate to use God's name, Yahweh. It's kind of funny, actually. So they weren't allowed to use God's name, Yahweh, so they came up with other names, and that's why you see God referred to as Lord so often in the Old Testament. And eventually, as they started adding in vowels, nobody knew how to say Yahweh anymore. They didn't know which vowels went there. So what they did was they took the vowels from the word Hebrew word of Lord, and they put it with the consonants of Yahweh, and that's how we come up with the word Jehovah, which is kind of a non-word, but now it's a word that we use all the time to refer to as God. Fast forward to now Jesus' time, that culture is still present. It's still present um, in that they have all these other names for God. Yes, they're speaking a different language, but they still refer to him as Lord, And one of their pet names for God is Holy One. But the difference between God, a Holy One, and Lord is that Lord can be used outside of referencing God. Like, I can call my master Lord, and I also can call God Lord. But Holy One is a title referred to only for God. Now, why is that so important? Because later on, in Jesus' career, when he just hinted at the fact that he was God, people tried to kill him. And there was many times that he would have to try and escape or just disappear. In Mark 
1, verse 24, there's a verse that refers to Jesus as Holy One. And it's really interesting. So the context behind this verse is that Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And this is like, I mean, it's Mark chapter 1. And Mark rushes things. So it could be later on in his career. But it's still pretty early. And Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And a man who is known to be possessed with a demon speaks up. And the demon speaks through him. And this is what the demon says. Let us alone. What have we done to you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? You, I know who you are. The Holy One of God. Isn't that so cool? This is a verse where Jesus is referred to as God outside. Like, he's not the one making that claim. A demon is. And it's early on his career, and people are still figuring out who is this Jesus character. And right off the get-go, he's recognized for who he is. So that very first statement of, I am the Holy One, found in verse 7, is a statement that says, I am God. Now this is also important because when we think of the time that this is written, this is probably a major, major challenge for that church of Philadelphia, for all Christians at this time, to make a claim that Jesus is God, when to use the title of Holy One for God, when that is something that is only used for God to describe Jesus, that would cause incredible strife between Jews and the early Christian church. Which, by the way, for as a side random note, for all you Mandalorian fans, called themselves the way. And uh, if you don't believe me, you can text me after this, and I will send you to some verses to do some Bible study of your own. So the early Christian church referred to themselves as the way. This is the way. But the early Christian church, they believed in Jesus, not just as a man, but somebody who was God. Jesus is God. The next title or introduction, part of the introduction that is given to Jesus, is the one who is true. And I don't know about you guys, but as soon as I hear that verse, I immediately think of um, the verse in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then John 14, verse Nope, John 1 verse 9, which says, True light which comes, which the true light which gives light to everyone and comes into the world. And then again, John chapter 6 verse 32, Jesus said, uh, said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread of heaven, but the Father gives you the true bread of heaven. All throughout John's writings and everything that he writes, when he is speaking in this topic of truth, he's referring to Jesus as the Messiah. As the Savior, the Holy One that is coming to save us. The one awaited, the bread of life. So, Jesus is God and Jesus is Messiah. The next section, he has the keys of David. Now this verse, uh, this section was kind of interesting to me, but I found that this is a direct reference to Isaiah 22, verse 22. The key of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. He shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Another reference to this key is found later on in Revelation where it says Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. A statement to say that I have power over life and death. I am that decision maker. So what is this key? What is its purpose? And why 
why has there not been an Indiana Jones movie made about it yet? It's something that we don't see very often. But here, I need to know what it is. So I did some research, and this is what I found. The key refers to the insignia worn by the chief administrator, and it would symbolize that the administrator would have authority to grant access to the king. The key is a metaphorical expression indicating complete control over the royal household. So Jesus is God, Jesus is Messiah, and Jesus is the gatekeeper. Combined with the second part of that section that refers to Jesus, he who opens and no one shuts, and he who shuts no one can open, a statement emphasizing complete and total control. And at first, when you think of God having this final control, it can be overwhelming if our vision of God is incomplete. When we have a faulty view of who God is, this can be kind of scary and intimidating to approach Jesus in this manner. But I want you to notice the very next thing that Jesus says after he states his authority as God, as Messiah, as the gatekeeper. What does he say? I know you. That's what he says to the church of Philadelphia. I know you. And that can be paralleled with the parable of the ten virgins. When you have the latecomers, the few that come and approach the house of the, bank, of the wedding feast, and they knock on the door, and the bridegroom answers, and he says, I know you not. I do not know you. Probably the most terrifying, terrifying section in the Bible, or statement in the Bible. I do not know you. I even had a student come up to me a couple years ago, and he said, D-Ray, that is what I am terrified of. That I will get to heaven's doors, and I will stand before Jesus, and he will say, I do not know you. It's crippling to think of that. But when you look at Jesus' message to the church of Philadelphia, he says just the opposite. He says, I know you. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Not denied my name. Jesus is God, Jesus is Messiah, and Jesus is the gatekeeper. And those gates are open. They are not shut. As I was reading commentaries, it was interesting to me how many denominations have tried to lay claim to the Church of Philadelphia. Sometimes it was the Baptist saying, I am the Church of Philadelphia. Sometimes it's the Presbyterian saying, I, we are the Church of Philadelphia. And even in the early Church of Adventists, we tried to do the same thing and say, we are the Church of Philadelphia. And we can poke fun all we want, but the beautiful thing about this is that we all can be. Because what God is emphasizing as their good works is not their denominational or belief focus, but their endurance in representing Jesus their endurance. See, the church of Philadelphia, it was a little church. It was the smallest church and the youngest church of the seven churches. And it was built in a city that was called Philadelphia, which means the one, one who loves his brother. The church of brotherly love endured.
And they didn't just endure and not have any trials. We know they had trials. They were small. They lived in Jesus' time, a time of great persecution for, young, for Christian churches. And not only after Jesus uh, is, right after Jesus says, you're doing great, you're keeping my word, you're holding true to this, he immediately res- uh, talks about somebody else and says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. We have seen, again, this harsh tone, this boldness in calling Jews, or a specific group of Jews, as from members of the synagogue of Satan in John chapter 8, verse 31 to 47. He's referring to a group of Jews who are depending upon their lineage to Abraham as the source of their salvation rather than the conviction of their hearts. John chapter 8, verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is harsh, this is bold, but that gives you a perspective of the hypocrisy that this church was fighting, because it would not be relevant for me to write Auburn a letter and talk about how wonderful Auburn is and then throw in a little bit about Alberta politics. That would be completely out of context in this letter. So we know that these are some of the challenges that this little church of brotherly love was facing. Now I will never say that Auburn is the sole representation of the Church of Philadelphia but I am a little biased, I must admit, because I love our church. And I believe that that this message to the Church of Philadelphia relates to us just as much as all the other seven messages. Auburn is truly a church of brotherly love. From the moment I first walked into our church, like four years ago already, it's hard to believe that it's been that long, I saw a church that exercised brotherly love in their service programs, through the ark, through community service, through the garden, and even in my pew from just right over there, the very first day, I remember Seth was reading the bulletin, and I said to Seth, are we in heaven? I'm not even joking. That sounds like an exaggeration. I have never found a church where I have felt so much at home. I've never walked into a church and felt church family like I do here. Last couple months ago, my parents were visiting, and it was, I think, the first time that we were able to come to church when they were visiting. And can I just say that it meant so much to me to be able to see and hear my parents were welcomed and that they felt safe and able to worship in our church on the very first day they attended. That fills me with joy. Auburn is a church of brotherly love. And I know that right now we are amidst trials and we stand in our living rooms or on our couches. Hopefully you're sitting on them. I know that there is uncertainty ahead, and no matter what we do, we will never be prepared for that uncertainty because we cannot see the future. But the Church of Philadelphia has a message. The doors are open, and Jesus is God. 
in Jesus as Messiah. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be embraced for endurance. The way will be opened for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest of casting them upon the burden bearer. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, he has prepared a way to be... Uh, sorry, I lost my spot. In every difficulty, he has prepared a way prepared to bring revive. Our, God, our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us, of which we know nothing about. Those who accept the one principle of making service and honor to God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Revelation 3, verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have and let no one so that no one can take your crown. On my flight back, I had the privilege of watching Frozen 2. It was the first time I saw it. And I must say, I was pleasantly surprised. This is not a pitch. They are not paying me. But they had an overarching message throughout the whole movie, and that message was, take the next, do the next right thing. When things get difficult, when you don't know how to go on, just do the next right thing. Or in the wise words of Dory, just keep swimming. Our world is uncertain, yes. There are unknown trials ahead of us, and we will never be prepared. Just do the next right thing. Continue in brotherly love and walk as Jesus did. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. I will write, oh, I will make him, sorry, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. You will be set in God's kingdom. I will write on him the name of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven, out of, uh, out of heaven for, from my God. I will write on him a new name. My friends, that is the message of the Church of Philadelphia. The doors are open. Dear Father in heaven, God, Messiah, and gatekeeper, Lord, thank you so much for your grace. God, in this trial, teach us to trust you. Trust you more and more. And as we are not together in the way that we normally are as a church, Lord, I ask that you draw close to every single person in their home. That they know you are there and that you see them. Amen.